did you want to be when you grew up? Well, I don't think I had, um, I definitely didn't have a very set idea of what I would be when I was grown up. I think um, the closest I ever had at one point of thinking, when, I, when I'm older I'm going to be, was, uh, which is going to age me quickly, was that I thought I might be Sue Barker, the tennis player. Yeah. <laughs> for about 10 minutes so I, I practiced relentlessly with a tennis ball on a string or elastic in fact in the middle of my street when I was growing up and I think it's much the same thing it was being able to wear a good pair of white socks up to your knees that was yeah. partly you know what was going on in my head there yeah. not because she was going out with Cliff Richard I hasten to add <laughs> although that probably proved to me that she really wasn't going out with Cliff Richard but anyway, uh, so those, those are the sort of closest I've had to an aspiration to be anything or anybody. Mm -hmm. And But if I look back now, I think if the question is, what, what were the roots of what you're doing now in your childhood? Mm -hmm. Then I think um, I, as an only child, I had to really make my own entertainment. Mm -hmm. So I grew up on a council estate in the 70s. Mum was working really hard, mm -hmm. single parent. So if I, and TV had about three channels and it was black and white. So really, and, and you know, in more context was that they used to listen to the radio on a Sunday and it used to drive me mad, it was so boring. So a lot of what I have ended up doing in, in a work way, oddly, came from this desire to sort of create entertainment, go out and connect in my community. I wouldn't have ever used those words, mind you. Uh, get out the house mm -hmm. and in the immortal world words of a tv show that i think maybe again dates me the um why don't you generation you know watch this program obviously for half an hour and then go and do something less boring instead so yeah so that is effectively i think the theme tune to my life really which is nothing's gonna happen unless you make it you can create your own fun alone all together and uh, yeah the world's there for you taking really leads 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 what is happening welcome to episode 17 of working hours a show about a place called leeds a time called now and an activity called work my name is simon and you're listening to my guest emma fairman this is my first Zoom interview, which I recorded on the 17th of May, 2021. Emma is the founder of Playful Anywhere. Playful Anywhere, CIC, is a Leeds-based social enterprise with a mission to catalyze creativity, inventiveness, and well-being with clients, the public, and through their own projects, Playbox, Playlab, and Young Inventors Club. Playful Anywhere loves to blur the boundaries between the physical and digital worlds encouraging participants to get creative with all manner of media, from cardboard to code. You can check out Playful Anywhere at www.playfulanywhere.fun. If you're a lawyer and you're listening to this, and you think you might be able to answer questions that you already know all the answers to, then please get in touch with me to arrange a time for us to record. Email me at workinghourspod at western-studios.com with a short bio and some suggestions of your availability. Also, drop me a line if you have any queries or feedback, complaints, compliments. If you can leave a review for me, then please do. I haven't had any feedback yet, so it would be great to see some. If you can leave a really good review, that would be really good. It's nice to be nice, isn't it? What is it that you're doing now, then? <laughs> yeah, so um, there's, a, so there's a vehicle for this called Playful Anywhere, which is a CIC, which is a community interest company, which... Um, really allows for project-based um, events, activities, commissions and contracts to sort of have some form of, I don't know, structure really. But so that helps. It's a very small kind of um, not-for-profit. And what that allows us to do really is to um, do place-based play stuff for all ages. So we've got three, well, three shipping containers that are usable and they've been uh, refurbished and turned into what we call play boxes. Mm -hmm. And they can go out to high streets, to leisure centre, car parks, to parks, anywhere really. Um, and their whole kind of purpose really is to catalyse um, conversations, creativity, fun, play obviously, uh, and get people enjoying, uh, well enjoying, probably doing things that they didn't know they were gonna do until they encountered us. Mm -hmm. um, 
kind of taking people from a bit of a sort of mindset of what are you going to deliver for us to over time, depending on how long we're in a place, uh, kind of a, a sense of, wow, we can make our own stuff, or I did this, and, you know, that sense of pride and ownership. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do with the shipping containers. We um, have had a record in animating and bringing to life empty shops. Um, so we, we've got one in St. John's Centre, which was a play lab until COVID, and now is probably going to be turned into a digital access um, repair shop. Uh, come robots repair lab, as we'd call it. So the sort of underlying principles of all of these things really are how can we do really great fun stuff which invites the widest participation and takes care of some of the reasons why people might not be able to participate in something by really thinking that through as well. So if not having access to the internet is one of your issues, then we need to take care of that. If not having that much money in your pocket is an issue, then we need to make sure that what we do is affordable or free. If uh, not feeling confident is an issue, you know, so we try to look at all, all the reasons why people can't have fun and yeah. lead playful, creative lives, and then gently try and design things which doesn't sort of uh, stigmatize anybody. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, so sort of like creating access, opening up space for people to to explore their own selves ultimately through play and through the opportunity to play and to create that space to say play you know rather than produce or work or you know just have fun and and find out how to do that because like with anything it's sort of practice isn't it the more you practice at something the better you get yeah and i think play is one of those really weird words that's sort of the minute you the more you say it the less it means as well so it's like it's also quite alienating as a word to people. It's like play, ugh, that's for kids, isn't it? Or I don't feel playful, I feel too stressed to play. Or, um, it, or when you say play, I mean this, what do you mean? So it's like, in, in one way it's great because actually if you can get into a conversation you understand that many people will have very diverse perspectives about what play might mean to them. But equally, if you overuse the word, people will just tune out and think, what are you talking about? So. We, it, this isn't for me so I suppose when you're thinking of the essence of what this is about it's about people finding the thing that brings them to life you know mm. what makes you feel good uh, what gives you a you know in psychological or um, biological ways it's about a flow state mm. losing track of time being like like a kid you know the thing when the hours melt away because you're so immersed in doing something you love doing that you do something for its own end not because you know there's a payment or reward or a pat on the back at the end of it you know that is therapeutically good for you to do as a human being to find those things that make you feel connected to yourself okay. so that is what we would call the intrinsic Thing of play is just that it makes you feel great right yeah well, whatever so, that is for you musical instruments football games card games board games making something playing with notions ideas yeah well uh, and it, well i was going to ask how how do you sort of personally define play because it's a it, it is like you say a very difficult thing to define uh, i heard someone talking about it as something that you know, you kind of have to eliminate everything else to say, oh, well, it's play. It's, it's not work. It's not this. It's not that. You know, you can't just say play is this. You have to say what it's not. So what what is your definition of play? I mean, I think in some ways I've, I've maybe not answered it fully in what I've just said, but my own personal interpretation of play is playing with boundaries. Hmm. How much can I get away with? Uh, what are the rules? What are the? What's really fun for me is to sort of see how far I can go with something. Mm. Um, if I pod away at this, and again, this is what you'll find. Um, people they find their limits, don't they? By seeing, you know, if I ask for that or I push at that, how far will I go? Now, if you can do that playfully, you're more likely not to get a smack around the chops, mm. or a, you know something that makes words of that, that effect so um, whether that 
so to my mind, that's a societal purpose I've got, which is these there are rules out there in the world that don't make sense to me. Yeah. Um, there are someone else has made these these rules up. Hmm. How how do we find out? So it's really like it's it's about power in many ways. Hmm. Do I have the power to put my shipping container down wherever I want to? You know, hmm. do I have to ask permission for that? Hmm. Uh, so even the sort of playful thought experiment of it is rewarding to me as a you know human being to test my own sense of what I can and can't do. Hmm. And yeah, does that make sense? It does make sense. So how did you? come to this sort of way of thinking this way of being so can you talk us through sort of developing the cic and sort of you know the first few things that you did god um why did it come about yeah so on a personal level i had i was running a website with a guy called phil kirby called the culture vulture mm -hmm. it's like a multi-author blog site and then um, i was running the twitter account for that and i had very small children probably about the age of two and under right. and i would be sort of like reflect i was as you know from my twitter i'm very open and our stream of consciousness will come out and i remember talking about coming into town with the kids and I, you know just saying does anybody else have this experience so it did definitely come from a what it's like to have children perspective at that stage right. and People would sort of talk about their experiences of public transport, of lack of green space near them, of antisocial things. Lots of reasons why they didn't feel the world was affording a playful experience for them or their children. Mm -hmm. um, so as I was asking these questions, more and more people were saying, well, this is my experience and this is my experience. So I realised quite quickly that I wasn't alone. You know, that my experience as a mum trying to get on a bus with two, you know, like two kids was writ large, not just in Leeds, everywhere, really. Um, and you just start to realise how poorly designed the world is for people who aren't, who've, who've got other caring commitments or aren't as able-bodied, you know, can't, all sorts of things make, started to open my eyes up to the fact that we don't design for difference. Yeah. And so... Even things like my, my daughter would be in potty trained, she won't thank me for sharing this, but you know, going into town with a child who needs to go there and then to the toilet, mm. you know, you, your brain starts to go, oh my God, I, I'm mentally mapping this space very differently to how I was before children. Yeah. And so then I'd have that conversation on Twitter and people would be saying, well, it's not just for children that that is an issue actually. And it's something we don't talk about, but you know, if you've got, I'm going to use this expression if you've got irritable because this is what did happen in a conversation irritable bowel syndrome for example then you may need to go when you need to go right and so the same thing that a toddler is communicating which is no time need now <laughs> so, so you're like okay so how how can we playfully navigate some of this stuff which makes a sort of physical experience of going anywhere or being somewhere a more playful one Mm -hmm. or play or has more affordance for playful experiences let's say mm -hmm. so play is not going to happen if you're poor if you're stressed if you're it's just not built into the way we design things or experiences to create mm -hmm. lovely spaces for people who we don't consider at the design process so but if you just start kind of how would you put it you can the way you want to go about creating the change you want to see really is to be it isn't it right. I think so instead of just kind of being cross at the world how do we playfully have conversations which invite many different voices into them to make the change happen that they want to see too and that's really where playful anywhere what is playful needs is born at that point really um so it wasn't just a child-friendly sort of lens mm -hmm. saying yes if we design for children we should be designing for all ages mm -hmm. and we're not doing that currently mm. uh, and the other, the other sort of flip side to this was actually as my children were growing up they would see the affordance for play anywhere in a city center you know aside from running into traffic you know they would find the ledges that they wanted to climb onto the this sort of, um i don't know railings they were almost like heat-seeking missiles, really, of what was playful from their perspective. And it was fun to observe them, 
kind of do things that I didn't do as an adult, you know, that running freely, climbing, exploring physically, you know, actually it's, it's, we think that play is like a swing slides and roundabouts. Mm. And, you know, if, you, if you're open to it and you've kind of done a little mini risk assessment in your head of can they run into traffic, will they, you know, but try not to sort of constrain them too much as well. Mm -hmm. if, so seeing what happens if you, and so if you see this with skateboarders, you see it with parkour, you know, you see it with that physical enjoyment of public space. Mm. You can, it's just what lens you choose to wear, really. So that's kind of where Playful Leads started. And then we did lots of events, which was around citizens kind of thinking about their city as a playground. We got with the business and we worked for Asda on a big event with community groups called Connect the Dots. We took over empty shops. Mm -hmm. We had events in museums. We just started to do lots and lots of things which brought people together to explore their own sense of um, what they would like to do more of to mm. where they lived or in the city centre. So with the corporate work, did you approach them or did they approach you? Um, Asda, um, in particular of Asda, I was cheekily using Twitter. In fact, this is the podcast I'm going to be on later, in fact, uh, with Don Birch, and he was kind of PR at that point, I think. And I just remember going to him and going, what about we do such and such? And we, a friendship formed, really. And then he started coming to events that we were running through the Culture Vulture. And then I started working with him on various different digital projects within Asda. Mm -hmm. And the Connect the Dots project kind of came out really because in that sense, a lot of business people would be working in the city centre of Leeds mm -hmm. and wouldn't leave their desks at lunchtime. They'd just carry on working right through. Yes. And there was, there was a sense of, you're physically in a space, but you're not connected to the space beyond work. Mm -hmm. So how do we connect the dots between what amazing independent retail, interesting stories that people exist within the local sort of area of Leeds around Asda and beyond? And how do we also for the there's a lot of there's a lot of people who go to work and wear a work hat, but actually they cost them much more than that. So there was a whole load of well, by, by day I work at Asda, but I'm a musician or I'm a mm -hmm. creative person. I don't quite know how I ended up in this role. Kind of thing. So we were like saying, well, actually part of this is connecting you back into your loves and passions and interests. But also there's a whole load of really interesting people doing very interesting stuff across Leeds. You would probably really benefit from the exchange of you getting to know a bit more about them, them getting to know a bit more about you. Yeah. And so we, we did this sort of, um, world cafe kind of process where people got to tell each other a little bit about themselves and some of the community and creative groups had ideas that they were trying to develop. And so it's like having a sort of gently warm sounding board of, oh, we want to put on this thing. And then they asked the people having a listen and sort of just, it was a bit, it was conversational coaching kind of stuff, really. Mm. And then a big top event at the end, actually, which was um, a sort of, at the end of the day a celebratory way of kind of saying what you know what they how they started the day actually it sounds quite terrifying even as I think about it you know in front of this massive big top um how they started the day and the kinds of things that had emerged through the day and so you know some of those led to sort of real change of like um one group wanted to put a big piece of artwork on a bit of land that Asda had quite a lot of influence and sway over so mm -hmm. they had deliberately come on the sort of connect the dots event so that they could make relationships with people within Asda because they'd been getting nowhere fast. Mm -hmm. And so that led to some shift. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there were some really good outcomes. And then there were also things which just didn't go any further. So the seeds, some will grow, some will wither, some will do nothing whatsoever. That's kind of the essence of play as well, though, isn't it? Of like, well, we'll just do a bunch of stuff. And then if anything comes out of it, great. And, and if it doesn't, it, also great, because, you know, we've passed the time and we've had fun, hopefully. Yeah, and I think if you take care of the bit of it's a really fun, enjoyable day. So if you take care of the like, if if nothing else, but that is what we achieve, mm -hmm. that is still a great outcome. Okay. And the dream, obviously, is that this this I liken it to sort of creating a sort of ground of fertile. It's a fertile ground for future friendships to flourish. That that is what I think play. If you can look at it as cultivation. Mm -hmm creates more likelihood of something lovely happening. Mm. That's kind of it. 
So when you went into this, I know you set up events, you set up spaces, you create spaces, you move spaces around in terms of the box. In terms of all the logistics and, and organising everything, was that a sort of learn as you go or did you already have those skills going into it or did you just rely on other people or you just went, oh, let's see what happens? Mm, so I can only, I'm usually the spark and then I have to work with other people mm. really because I'm really, in, you know, it's not like I'm incapable, but I certainly don't have the strengths that others have. And so I suppose I'm a really good talent spotter as well. And when I mean talent, mm -hmm. it's not like I'm looking for talent. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for people who love doing things. That That is what then they generally become quite good at because they love it. Yeah. So my whole kind of amorphous blob of work, really, as I look at it, really depends on who I've encountered. Because as soon as you encounter someone who goes, I love doing such and such, it kind of takes you off in a direction in a way so um you might start off thinking this is the plan but when you encounter new people it can shift this is what so but you know there will still be things that um you do need to do in order to achieve any of those things so like i have become okay i suppose at knowing how hauliers work yeah to shift shipping containers around I couldn't, I wouldn't want to be a haulier myself, but you know, I know who the good ones are who turn up, who are nice and yeah. they're amazing. I know how they like to schedule their days so that you, you know, my little jobs are generally not very, you know, they don't remunerate them very well and they're not very exciting to them. They just see it as a shipping container. They're not interested in the why of it at all, really. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, I suppose if I was to write a CV, I'd have project management, budget control, all of those things that I actually think are just things you have to do in order to get from A to B. Yeah. Not that I want to be a project manager. Yeah. Or a producer, all the names that you get, that's a, well, that's a producer role or yeah. a creative director role or a project manager role or a digital inclusion role or it, it all feels like, well, they're just names, aren't they, for things that you do to make something happen. Yeah. And I think with a lot of them, they're becoming, you know, less, less, less relevant in a lot of ways because people are doing, you know, they're starting to cross boundaries so much more that, you know, that you're so many things, you know, you, you're, if you did your job titles, like, you know, events and producer and like head of the company and in charge of ideas and it's just too long. So it can't, it can't encapsulate everything that you do. But I'm not brilliant at any of those things either so the kind of generalist nature of it all is that I know that um like podcasts for example I know that I can output you know something from zoom it'll be raw and polished I can present it in that way of course I know that I, I have neither the inclination or desire to become really polished at podcasting mm. but I, I like to meet people who do want to do that yeah. you know so that I have like the ability when next I'm talking, you know, I was talking to a friend who's a coach, she was like saying that she wants to do some podcasting and had a very particular thing that she wanted to do in her podcast. And but she's like, but I don't know how to podcast. And I was like, well, just have a go, work out what you don't know and then find out who the people are out there who can help you with the bits you don't know, right? Yeah. And to my mind, it's like the, the podcast world, people go, we don't, we don't need another podcast. I'm like, that's not really the point to my mind. Podcasting is a beautifully intimate experience mm. where even if you've got two or three people who are listening in and they're really getting some benefit from it, it that is the key thing. It's not necessarily about mass broadcast. It's a very, in, you know, it's a very, I, I did read a beautiful article about the whole fact about the intimacy of podcasting. And I was like, that is why it really appeals to me as a format to listen to, but also to you know, if we were to make one, you know, to feel like your is it like your tribe is definitely a sense of um not seeing with people who really want to connect over that subject matter. Mm. Which um, yeah. Which in terms of sort of, you know, you can see that negatively as like going towards a sort of echo chamber thing of people of just meeting and discussing the same things. But you know, you find more often than not when you find someone who's interested in something that you're interested in you bond on those experiences and then you find out a whole bunch of new things that they're into and and vice versa you know you have that exchange of uh, culture I suppose for want of a better term but you yeah you, you do have that transmission of, of new ideas and new concepts even within a small circle obviously it's great to kind of diversify and bring in new voices and meet other people and 
look in new areas that you wouldn't necessarily look. But that's not closed off from starting at a point of meeting with commonality and familiarity and, and things that you both like. So it um, gives you license, doesn't it? I think that's sort of thing of like going back to where I started the culture vulture and other websites before that was the license to go and explore and discover. You know, so people weren't ever bothered by how many readers we had or it really wasn't the question anybody would care about actually it was like the fact that I went and said you look really interesting mm. tell me more about what you're up to and I think people just don't feel seen very much you know like we're billions of people on this planet and actually someone you know not everybody walks around thinking they're interesting mm. but most people are interesting mm. <laughs> So you're being curious in itself is a very lovely thing for people to experience. Mm. Um, and I really, really enjoy that, you know, kind of meeting people and being curious about them. Mm. And people going, gosh, nobody's asked me that question before. So that's why I like going on other people's podcasts because it's therapeutic as well for me. Yeah. I can see how it affects other people when you're interested in them. Yeah. And then you become really good at connecting, you know, like, oh, person who loves doing this and I know a person who's really good at that and that's yeah. what it's all about really isn't it yeah exactly I mean part of the reason that I'm doing this is because I, I came back to Leeds in 2015 I've been away for a long time lived in Amsterdam lived in London for a while I did some traveling and um came back here I was just doing temp jobs and it was like this is this is boring and other people that I knew that were still here you know like for my old mates that I'd stayed in touch with they all knew loads of people and it was like, why do they know all these people? And I don't know anybody. And it's like, well, they've been been here for the past 15 years. Meeting <laughs> <laughs> you haven't. So part of the reason I want to do this is like, I know there's interesting people in Leeds. Like, how do I access them? Yeah. The other thing you said as well about, um, you know, people being seen and going up to them and, and kind of being curious about them. I'd like to hear your experience of that journey. Obviously, I'm kind of starting out with sort of at the moment my process is being like broad invites I'm, I'm realizing that you have to be specific and you have to kind of narrow things down to people of like are you this particular thing and then you might get a response but then there's there's still people who are that thing that you're looking for they're just thinking it's not me I wouldn't be interesting and you must have encountered people like that how do you how do you kind of coax people out how do you bring that out of people how do you make them feel comfortable well, it's a good question, actually, because I suppose I've got multiple ways in doing it. So like on Twitter, which is my favourite place to hang out, I suppose. Well, in, I have equivalence in the physical world, but in on the digital world, Twitter is my favourite place. There were questions. I, I love questions. So crafting a question is my absolute favourite thing. And I think if you can get a good question, People can respond to it or not as they see fit. So it's not like you must respond. But if, if you've crafted a good question, it might actually sit with somebody, not just for that day, but maybe it'll keep coming back. Because as the question, it might have value. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I'm, I believe in a sort of form of questioning, which is called appreciative inquiry. Yeah. Okay. So actually allowing people to kind of reframe almost through the questions that you're using. So I could use a load of negative questions, I just don't want to do that because I don't want to put people's heads in a place of despair and sadness. So if I'm going to ask a question, it might be something evocative or emotional or something, you know, pleasant or connecting, which allows people to disclose or reveal a bit of something that allows someone else to go, oh, that's interesting. You know, mm -hmm. so you're the best analogy really is like imagining you're a pub landlord or a pub landlady or something, which is your job is to create a convivial space. Mm -hmm. And the way that you welcome people, make eye contact, talk to them, allow for you to still run a decent pub because you've still got all the other things to do. Mm -hmm. But your job really is to uh, you know, create that space for the person who wants to drink alone at the bar. And we can use other analogies because obviously drinking culture is not the only way we can organise our you know, metaphors and analogies and what have you. But my nan was a landlady, so I saw this in you know, an action, a village pub where you could nurse half a shandy for hours and nobody would bother you, or you could be playing crib or darts or playing in some kind of group or, you know. So the dynamics of creating space mm. is always 
in my mind of like what are the questions that will enable us to have a convivial time together mm. not just me being in the center as the person behind the bar doing all the pump you know i've still got the kitchen to work with and the toilets got blocked and the barrels need changing and the dog's barking and there's somebody at the off license and there's that person who's telling come in for the six gold label bottles of for their alcoholic hair you know that is what you're doing really you're thinking like a village mm. yeah. so i think if you know what you're wanting to achieve somewhat your questions will shape themselves in a way okay. you know why my purpose is and it, it's not a judgment for me as to your purpose Mm -hmm. if you've roughly got an idea of what you're seeking to achieve mm. then your questions will kind of elicit certain things yeah yeah I, but yeah i would agree with that i want to um so you mentioned design a couple of times and talking about how things aren't aren't really designed for anyone apart from you know the, it's <laughs> it's like the ergonomics thing the, the thing i heard was about heating in buildings like heating in buildings is generally designed for some 40 year old white man in the 60s and it's like this is why nobody's temperature is 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 right you know you work in offices the person next to you is always and or you you know you someone's always unhappy with the temperature in an office um, and it's a similar thing with the the spaces of the design for a kind of an imaginary person that doesn't really exist uh, yeah. so do you have do you have a design background yourself or is this something that you came to realize about how important design was what uh, given that you are in a business of designing spaces for play and uh, what what's your relationship to design it's, it's funny because i suppose it's only recently i've even used the word design i was a, unconscious i suppose that i was actually designing anything mm -hmm. um so but the more i look at it of course i am really because i'm mm -hmm there's an intent behind what I'm trying to achieve or what have you. So of course you are designing. I just wasn't explicit. So I do have an arts background, but again, I did the art foundation course. And at that point, <laughs> for those who haven't experienced an art foundation course, it's the best year of education. It's just amazing. You get to have a go loads and loads of different things, different materials, Again, it's playing. So you're playing, really, because you're, the, the pressure is not, you know, maybe you want to go off to art college or whatever. But to all intents and purposes, you're given a whole load of stuff. Some people can show you how to use that stuff. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to specialise. And so I suppose that that is what I'm trying to design as an experience through life for me and others, mm -hmm. is this kind of less outcome-oriented culture of... Have a go, try things. Don't worry if it doesn't work out. Find out what you love doing. And actually, even through that process, we realize you are not an artist. Yeah. <laughs> I did know, and I was like, wow, the people who really want to make their career out of this, they've got something in them I don't. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, but what I look back on and think of that year was how interested I was in everybody else's studios, all the work, you know, so I was the social glue of like, going around everybody else and looking at what they were doing and going, hey, let's have a party. And um, I remember a particular um, crit session with the head of photography who was like trying to you know, help us work out what careers we wanted. Mm -hmm. he, he came to me and I'm not very good at, I think, I speak before I think, I suppose. Yeah. And uh, I went, I just want to have like, a really nice cafe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And was like, why are you here? You <laughs> <laughs> should have been really obvious to me. Um, but I suppose what I was describing was the space, the feeling of a nice cafe, if not a nice cafe. Mm. So yeah. I think, you know, lubrication helps no matter which space um, you're going to create. The design, design, I suppose, now I'm conscious of it. I am using the word more often. Mm -hmm. um, because there is intent and it is conscious and mm -hmm. my consciousness though is I don't want people to feel they're in a very designed space yeah I want it to feel really like natural yeah or that they or that they are well you want it to be kind of a, a an empty space really don't you for them to you know it's like it needs to be 
But well, the way I imagine it, it's kind of like it needs to be fresh snow for someone to go and jump in and put their footprints in. And like, yes. Do you have the box? The box opens up. The space is actually the the area that it's been put in, and then people have to build within that. That's it, and that's really for some people. Like again, it can divide people very quickly. So like. Uh, I was tweeting this yesterday about structure and I'm also really starting to learn about neurodiversity as well so the design of space for people who have different preferences and different energies mm -hmm. you know so actually a lot of what I was designing for um, without really knowing it was I think I have probably ADHD so there's a definite like impulse I have but my son we've recently sort of had an assessment and he has dyspraxia and a lot of the sort of bodily sort of energies, explanation of energy and what they call perception, perception let me say it properly, you know, this need to externalize energy mm -hmm. and manifest itself in one minute, like swooshing about, like needing loads and loads of space mm -hmm. to be comfortable, to kind of express, to feel, you know, not necessarily uncoordinated, but just to be in your body. Yeah. Um, without fear of judgment or what have you and then quick as quickly as the wind can turn to kind of want to be quiet and feel like you're able to go into this little snug area and you know you've had enough of people for example you know so trying to even just work those spaces out for our own needs mm -hmm. wasn't I wasn't even conscious of that but thinking actually people need these different spaces which allow them to switch from one Kind of emotional physical state to another without it being like really like and now you're going to go into this quiet corner and now you're going to run around in like a you know so um where am i going with this so the, the structure bit is it, it can feel too too structured sometimes too rigid yeah we, we're not like that are we you know like oh i've got to go and stand in that box now so being able to go, we need fluidity within our structures, which allow for changes in feelings and temperatures and mood, etc. Mm -hmm. um, is one thing. And then the other is quite often we're very conditioned to having a, an itinerary or a plan. So yeah. I would definitely notice this with, I want to make a huge generalization here, but mums would come into a space and they would, the children would just barrel forward and do whatever they fancied doing. And, you know, we laid out a smorgasbord of materials or cardboard or slime, you know, different things they could go and dive into. And they would find the thing they wanted to do. And if it didn't exist, they'd come and tell you. Mm -hmm. Right. And then mums would just sit back on their shoulders and would sort of like, oh, take away off, have a cup of coffee, talk to someone, diddle about on their phone. We didn't ever really care. We don't care. And that was it, you know, two hours later, the kids, you know, just a sense of like unfolding, really, unfurling. But if you like structure and you like to know what's happening at a certain time, mm -hmm. what it, what are the rules of engagement here? You know, that, that sort of free-flowing thing can actually be really an, an, alienate, an alienating experience. Yeah. So equally, we've got to work out how do we do the things that feel... Um, I call it like a breadcrumb trail, really, of things that are known, understandable, recognisable conventions mm -hmm. that don't make somebody feel silly if they yeah. don't know how to encounter free-flowing stuff. Yeah. So you need things like your Lego and whatever's popular. Uh, yeah. And maybe a bit of this happens at this time. Uh, this is, you know, some language stuff around how to engage with a space. Yeah. So it's, it's not like, oh, my God, is this run by a weird group of people who are going to make me do Kambaya at some point? Yeah. That would be a participation. Yeah, is it Rainbow Rhythms or <laughs> like Peep Show? We all have to do strange dances. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's a really good point. I was going to ask you about, you know, for people who are quite structured, because, you know, whether you're, you're structured because it, it, it's a kind of crutch that is the way that I see it. It's either something that you've been kind of indoctrinated in that you need to have these, like, what are the rules here? How do I have to behave? Where do I go? Where is everything situated? Or people that need that because they, they need that certainty there. Do you know what I mean? Of like, it, they, they need something to hang on to, you know, whether it's a conceptual thing or, or a physical thing of like, I, I need something to hold on to here just to feel safe. That's yeah. the way that I kind of see it. 
I don't have a question with that, but that was just... <laughs> just You're absolutely right. I think if something looks like it's so chaotic or endless, mm. you know, is there an end to this thing? Mm. Am I committing myself to five minutes or five hours? Yeah. You know, it's that, it's kind of, oh my God, I don't know if I want to step over the threshold into that space. But I, I mean, going back to you, you sort of mention of flow, if you're thinking with regards to flow, um, if I'm thinking about flow, if I'm doing something that I'm interested in, that I get lost in, you get to that point where, you know, you, your biophysical reality comes in, whether you want a cup of tea or you need to go to the loo or whatever it is, you reach a point or even just you reach a natural point in the thing that you're doing where you're like, this isn't working, I need to take a break from it, I need to step back from it. And it can be any amount of time. So suppose with people like that, where they're, they're quite structured and like you say, you mentioned the Lego. Yeah. Like, I mean, that was an obvious one of like, you just put a bunch of Lego in front of someone. They know what to do with it. Even if they just end up building a tower, at least they, you know, they're starting to engage with it. Yeah. So are there are any other, are there any kind of like winning toys that are really good for kind of breaking the ice with people? Yeah, so I think um, what I've learned is, so like fiddle toys, you know, fiddle fidget stuff has become really, people have become much more aware of that now, actually, mm -hmm. but the sort of need to sort of do something with your fingers. Mm -hmm. um, also the need to feel purposeful. So again, that sense of like, even if it wasn't a play space, people always want a sense of what can I do, right? So not many people in my experience will just come and sit down and just don't care about anything else or anybody else. You know, they, they kind of want to know what their role is. Yeah. So always, <laughs> so the kind of things that you can have to give people something to occupy themselves with, right? So an event might be fashion, a, a name badge, but don't just do it in a book. You know, here's a load of stuff and it's up to you. Now, some people get thrown by that and they'll go, I'm not very creative. You know, so how you welcome people is really important. So it's not a case of you've got to do something really wacky. Mm -hmm. It's just like offer the opportunity to, if you wish to, without making it feel divisive if people don't. Right? So there's, even those little touch points, how do you welcome? And sitting group work or individual or sort of smaller pairs, for example, is finding things that allow people to have good conversations without feeling like they have to be face to face and make eye contact. Mm -hmm. So side by side activities, you know, so like um, it's what works for everybody. I mean, Lego is totally one of those things, but things like winding, um, so like lumps of clay, plasticine, pom poms. Pom poms have always surprised me because we gender things quite a lot, like crafts are quite gendered. Yeah. I've never met anybody yet, whichever gender, who doesn't like actually making a pom pom once they start set about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the other thing about things like those pom-poms are that they're actually we will use a pom-pom maker which allows people to go oh i used to make it like this oh this is a newfangled thing isn't it so you definitely have the ability to kind of talk about how people used to do things how they're using this particular contraption and then because, because you're winding sooner or later it becomes unconscious mm -hmm. So you can sit there quietly doing it, or you can have a chat with someone else, right? Or you can start saying, oh, can I borrow the scissors? So the different ways that you've created the ability for people to sort of make connection with each other or not. But they, you know, the quiet person who just wants to make a really damn good pom-pom can just do that without needing to feel the pressure to chat. Yeah. So you're thinking about all the things that make people feel uncomfortable and you're trying to sort of alleviate them to some degree. So yeah. some people will look for a job to do and they'll say, can I help with the washing up or whatever the thing is. And then it's a bit going back to your thing about an empty box. You've got enough in it so that people can step into it and think there's a role for me if I want one. Mm -hmm. So if you were a really perfectionist, you would have got the washing up done. You'd have, you know, you've got to get, it's got to be a slight bit of like, I call it designed incompetence. And I'm really shit at barbecues, but that's kind of never become good at them because I know other people like that role more than I want it. Yeah. So we did a whole session of barbecue evenings in a park for six months. And, you know, it's known I would burn the sausages. Good, because <laughs> I don't want to be the person behind the barbecue. And you do. <laughs> uh, so. 
Well, there's a couple of other questions that I want to go into. I'll, I'll go through the sort of um, more standard kind of formally stuff. So let's talk about the last year. Uh, so with lockdown, uh, what plans did you have before lockdown, the first one started? Uh, and how did it change as you went into lockdown and through lockdown and then coming out the other side? What, what, how has it changed your business? How has it changed your, your thinking? Um, and how was the whole experience, I suppose? <laughs> Oh, that's a big one, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? After a full <laughs> year of this. <laughs> oh dear. So um and an odd time to think about it because now our minds are moving into a place of it's done now, you know, even though it's not necessarily, but I think a lot of us are feeling that like, oh, you know, it's definitely getting a bit better now. It's a real interesting thing, isn't it? Because I suppose underlying the principles of playfulness um are some deeper questions about being adaptable, dealing with emergence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I suppose in some way, and being a self-employed person as well, you know, the, the reality is for people who are self-employed, you never get that comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you've got regular retained work and your know, business is doing, you, you've always got that background hum, I think, of it's my end tomorrow. Yeah. I'm only as good as my last job. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you're in a sort of, your mindset, generally speaking, is always in a hustler mode, yeah. I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> so that can keep you on your toes, it can be quite exhausting, but it has a lot of benefits as well. And so I think if you've, if you've kind of embraced this life, you have got to constantly find new ways to reinvent and use the materials and skills and energies that you've got, mm -hmm. no matter what the context. Mm -hmm. And that is leadership theory, really. You know, there's leadership. I've worked with a great guy. He was working a lot way before lockdown. And, you know, there's sort of one of those models is called VUCA, isn't it? Volatile, uncertain. It's not chaotic. I always forget what the C uh, and the AR. But anyway, there's, there's a theory, which is about volatility. And we're, we're in a volatile, volatile time. So my, my view is if you can keep um, a playful, emergent mindset, even when you're really stressed and it's the thing you can kind of almost go back to as your actual safe space mm -hmm. which is i can actually create value out of a piece of chalk mm -hmm. right i can do something tomorrow because that is what play allows you to do is to conceive of different situations imagine different possibilities mm -hmm. so it is about constant reinvention so that is a sort of philosophical way of framing the fact that of course I was polaxed <laughs> <laughs> when the pandemic came because my business was actually starting to really sort of bear fruit in fact um, yeah. of the work that we've been doing for the last I don't know five years of getting in commissions and contracts to go and do really interesting stuff in other local authorities looking at play in place and health and well-being and we kind of more or less got to a point of finding a headquarters site for our developing idea for multiple boxes um, of play, food, drink, growing, um, recycling, upcycling, the Playbox Planet. So mm -hmm. we'd, we'd actually located a site. So all the things that I've kind of been working towards were starting to come to fruition at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, obviously, quite a lot of what we do involves people being in a space together mm. physically mm. and people touching objects mm. and whilst a lot of it is outdoor actually which is one of the blessings of what we do if not in winter obviously the world just really, well, collapsed didn't it in that sense of like even if the idea could have worked in an outdoor space people's brains their capacities their ability to anything other than firefight meant that the things that we needed to keep pressing ahead just went to pop completely so people yeah. being available to talk to you to answer emails yeah your team players being at home with their kids you know me being at home with my kids all the things kind of just went mm, can't do this i think the best thing i did do was to accept it accept it and go this is the reality yeah there's not a lot that's within my power other than how we create a harmonious home, really. I can't fight this. The best thing to do is to be, you know, as 
as, as much as possible with everybody's different emotions to just try and enjoy this weird time. Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah. Because that's the only thing I have any control over. Yeah. Well, it's like, you, you know, you, you've been locked, you've been put under house arrest, essentially. It's like, well, how am I, how am I going to pass this time? So, you know, you, you know your own house, but you don't normally spend as much time in it as, as we have done. So it's, it's, you know, again, creating spaces and creating, to a degree, routines uh, to keep you, keep you occupied and to make some, you know, make the day seem different. I think one of the things that's so hard is that it's like always the same, you know, and especially yeah. people who were like, all they do is I, I work, you know, whether they were going in or they're doing it online and work, stop working, go to sleep, get up, work again. And that's yeah. it. I can't see anyone. I can't socialize. You know, it's uh, yeah, very, very difficult for a lot of people. But then for a lot of other people, it's like, well, you know i've got to i've got to do something with this time and i know a lot of people were like oh i'm gonna have these intentions of i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do this and then ended up not doing any of it <laughs> did you find that having the sort of because you're doing play and you would be working still around ideas of play did you find that that helped you find creative solutions and helped you sort of keep ticking along it gave you some structure even yeah, so in terms of the family, though, it's hilarious because obviously they're, you know, they're bored, they're bored of all the things I find interesting. They live with me all the time, don't they? So even trying to sort of turn schooling into like magic school, which was one of my early attempts to sort of <laughs> look at the curriculum and go, let's turn this into like wizard class or whatever. <laughs> Honestly, it was just <laughs> I was like, let's decorate unicorns and dot them around the neighborhood. All my ideas were just like, nah not interested <laughs> so uh, I quickly tired of the attempts to be a good teacher that was a bit like so then I am fully embraced this whole thing called unlearning which was pretty much like all learning's a bit too rigid so we all kind of got in the first phase of lockdown we really quite enjoyed being very just doing whatever we wanted to basically my daughter's just come back like a drowned rat uh, <laughs> so, so bless her um so I think it was letting go, like you say, of the ambitions you might have to do something. But I did get involved in digital access stuff. So um, one of the projects we were doing before lockdown was a thing called uh, YouTube Makers Club with kids from across yeah. the city. And a lot of my other work I've done will have sort of digital inclusion and access elements to it. And we recognised very quickly, or let's just say I've known for a while, that obviously digital equipment and connectivity is not spread equally across any city not the state so um we sort of recognized at the beginning of lockdown actually there were going to be a lot of people expected to do online learning mm. and libraries were having to shut and the ability to actually know who needed what was hard because we couldn't communicate other than digital yeah so we knew there were gaps out there but we just didn't know who needed what so um, a small group of us got set up a thing called Digital Access West Yorkshire, which was all volunteer led. Mm -hmm. um, so there was Jack from the Hyde Park Book Club, um, Gail from Creative Carverley, Claire Garside, um, who does a lot of educational tech stuff, and um, tech volunteers, oh, Ben McKenna, who runs Solidaritech, who does amazing stuff with refugees and asylum seekers. So we literally just went, look, what can we do? Because we know there's a need, but we don't know what the extent that need is. So um, we set up Digital Access West Yorkshire, and then we had three really brilliant technicians volunteer their time. They were on furlough or uh, weren't working. So that sort of became the sort of thing I actually invested quite a lot of time and energy into in the end. Mm -hmm. um, whereas my sort of other work just sort of heated out a bit, really. Yeah. But it felt like there was a sense of mini play boxes as well. So they were like working with LS14 Trust who um, have a shipping container called Playbox 3, which is part of a networked approach we want to sort of develop further. They were like very close to the communities that they sit, sit within and serve. Yeah. And they were like, we know that people can, not um, you know, aside from food, drink, medicines, et cetera, which they were delivering, yeah. they'd sort of switch from being a community development space to a, you know, one of those first responder type operations right it's you know 
once people got past that need, then their real need was they were going up the walls of boredom, right? So the creative arts stuff that we would normally do, Naomi and Howard um, from NS14 Trust and fall into place. Like we need to get these things out to families who can't leave the home and to isolating people. And so we worked on a project called Mini Playbox, which was a smaller version of the shipping container. And then Seagulls Paint and Kirkstall got involved in that as well. Yeah. And so this whole kind of like, they they were all very hot on the distribution delivery. I did a lot of the digital elements of it. Um, it's a coordination really. There were a couple of projects that sort of emerged because they met a need and they were still about play, creativity and connectivity, but in a digital time when not everybody would have that, you know, be able to do it equally. Yeah. Yeah, so th those sort of felt like I was contributing in a time when otherwise I felt like I don't know really quite how to get my own business back on track, really. Mm. I think people did want to, if they could, you know, you saw the sort of mutual aid groups that sprung up, mm. lots of really neighbourly kind of activity, community activity. You know, people do want to feel that they're useful or that they're helpful. Mm. So, well, they're, um, yeah, yeah. They're helpful, useful, needed. <laughs> required <laughs> yeah and sometimes it's like with digital access stuff sometimes the problem feels so vast but actually if you bring it back down to its simplest form it's what one thing can we do today what you know so we have this motto you still do which is called act fast at local you know so get one machine from somebody who doesn't need it wiped and cleaned and restored to someone who does need it mm. you know so it wasn't like let's tackle the mountain uh, of gazillions because that's probably how many needed to be done but yeah. let's just put in a process which enables flow actually between and so the whole circular economy stuff which has always been interesting to all of us is that really which is there is stuff which is in unevenly distributed mm. some people have stuff sitting on their shelves doing nothing some businesses yeah. do um but the bit of like making it safe to pass on to somebody was the bit they couldn't do yeah and again with the people who needed things we went at the grassroots but we worked with a group of or we do i, I keep saying it in the past tense we are still continuing to do this we work with a group of referrers who do work with the people whether it's refugees and asylum seekers or children or women who've fled domestic violence you know there's a massive range of people that will we don't get to see the end recipients of the devices, but the referrers will be working with them directly and will be identifying who needs what. Yeah. And our job really is just to get, as, as my friend Claire, who's on the team put it, uh, we ship tin, you know, we're not trying to do all the other things yeah. like the skills bit or the Wi-Fi bit. Yeah. We're going to get machines from one place to another. Yeah. So it kept it quite simple, really. Yeah, it's a good approach. <laughs> simple's best. There's, there's less fail points with simple. I think I think it's dangerous in a time when you feel overwhelmed to try and eat the whole elephant. Yeah. It's like we got we can't do that. We just it's too big. Yeah. What, what can we do? Yeah. I keep saying to my my little nephew who's four, how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> One mouthful at a time. <laughs> yeah, and that's it really. And I think that that's the way we've got to go about things. Just do one small thing. Did you ever consider a couple of silly questions now because we are talking about play? So, first silly question is um, Did you ever consider having everyone in like basically hazmat suits for the play and so that they were COVID safe? <laughs> well, there was, I mean, yes, if I was a benevolent dictator, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think the crew fancy it as much as I might fancy seeing it happen, yeah. but. I kind of like Zorb as well, you know, the yeah. Zorb balls. I was like, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? Now, the, the thing that stops us doing anything like that is budget, ultimately. So if, if someone listening to your podcast says, you know what, we'd really like to support you to do even more crazy daft stuff. Yeah. Um, then do let me know, because ultimately, like I said, we, we create some, we hustle. Mm. We, we're constantly sort of trying to build a business with not huge amounts of money coming in. Mm. so we could spend more money i think on business development and commercializing some of what we do mm. in order to bring in more money to have hazmat suits and zorballs and 
yeah more daftness but it sounds it's kind of like you need more seriousness to get more silly yeah basically <laughs> You know, someone, someone who's good at commercial stuff because honestly i mean I'm, I'm really good at asking but i don't always know how much to ask for or you know the value proposition and who right. who really would want this so if i know those things i'm quite happy to go and bang on anyone's door but you know i do genuinely believe that in certain contexts play has no value at mm -hmm. all so nobody wants to pay for it which is why we don't have it in statutory it's not a statutory right in english law to um, uphold the UN Convention for Children's Right to Play, which is terrible. Well, I would say that England is dedicated to stopping play. You know, like the, 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 the general trend of any government in this country is generally, oh, are you having fun, are you? Well, we'll have to put a stop to that. Yeah. <laughs> That's the impression I've always had here. You're right. And I think it's because we're, we're seeing, so I'll go back to the sort of Protestant work ethic, Calvinist mindset that we have grown up in, really, in a monarchistic country right so we are serfs ultimately and we're here to be if not robots then makers of value for gdp reasons yeah which is the antithesis of play let's be honest yeah because what would happen if we all woke up from this torpor that we're in and actually recognize that we had rights we had critical thinking abilities we could enjoy our lives beyond nine to five mm. I'm a heretic radical here, right? It's like, yes, work is great. It's great. It's great for the soul to do things that you love doing and that you feel you're adding value to the world. Mm. But actually, we're more than economic units. Mm. Um, are you familiar with David Graeber? Yes, sadly, he passed away, didn't he? Yeah, last year. Um, yeah, that was devastating for me. What was it? What was the thing that I was going to say? Um, oh, yeah, so he, he was talking about... Uh, this obsession with production and he's like you know you make a cup once you wash it a thousand times and it's like why is the obsession always on production and you know even bringing up like something like the biden plan of like there's a big infrastructure spend you know which is trump's supposed plan as well but why do these things always have to be infrastructure and infrastructure spends and, and production spends you know why is none of the consideration about maintenance about uh, and even stuff like care, you know, care at the end of the day is to a degree a level of, of maintenance and, you know, I suppose it's more than that, but, you know, there's an element of maintenance in it. Yeah, so again, I'm just agreeing with you, it's not really a question. <laughs> no, but I think it's great because I think the premise of talking about work hmm. is interesting because I often will talk about performative things that we do um, in order to pay the bills, right? Hmm which work can quite often look like. Yeah. You know, so this conversation could be quite a different conversation, couldn't it? But like, what, yeah. what tasks do you perform? <laughs> what yeah. status do you uh, want in life? What are the symbols of your achievements in life? You know, we're conditioned into that sort of way of looking at people's value and worth mm. through so, a work lens. Yeah. More so than we are like, what. What, what makes you feel happy you know we don't so even the questions that we ask each other have a very work oriented um stance to them yeah. about questioning what is this work that we talk of and why are we doing it and what would we be doing if we were on a universal basic income for example yeah if if we had a long-term experiment to to actually really truly really understand who we would be if we weren't anxious and had scarcity mindsets mm you know and actually would people still do the things that need doing if they didn't have to you know we're never going to find that out because we're never going to play with this notion that there's a different way of designing and organizing our lives although i say never that's a that's a bit of moral uh, well that's sort of like a imaginative failure yeah well is it an imaginative failure or is it just you know your sense of is it pragmatic realism of just like I, I can only bang my head against this wall for so long, it's never going to come down. But I'll go, I'll keep doing it. Yeah. I mean, there's, a, there's an experiment about to happen in Wales, I believe, which is yeah. quite close to home. Um, I, I do despair a little bit, though, that they, they're given like two, some of these experiments given like about two years. And that, you know, the way they're presented in the media are things like, well, you know, whilst productivity didn't increase, people were presenting less at the doctors for medication, you know, as if that was like, a, oh, it's like, well, imagine that over 10 years then. Yeah. 
Oh, uh, oh, GDP went down by 1%, but um, the happiness index has gone through the roof. But that doesn't matter. So, you know, yeah. we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> so we'd rather deal with medicalizing. I mean, so much of my work with Mike Chitty will have put words in my mouth, if I'm honest. So, like, you deal with the bit which is the farmer, you know, uh, let's give you treatment, let's chop off your legs and limbs, mm. rather because that's a visible thing that people can account for, right? Mm rather than creating the conditions when none of those things needed to happen in the first place, because we can't, we can't count it if it didn't happen. You know, so since firefighting my mentality, we put money at the critical care end rather than the, what if we create the conditions that people didn't need to, mm. you know, be on antidepressants or, mm. you know, decide that life wasn't worth living or feel that they're in competition for resources because they seem finite or feel valued by their ability to be this or that you know we, we just do not organize ourselves in those ways mm. i don't think you expected this as your podcast did you <laughs> no it's uh, no it's fine honestly anime this is that i, I mean I, i'm with you 100 percent on all of this when i when i started this my initial thing was because i was like oh god i hate jobs so much uh, <laughs> i'm sick of doing these jobs they're all rubbish I started this very much with the perception of like everyone that I'm going to talk to is all going to be like, oh, work sucks, you know, and that typical, and, and that's been my, you know, largely my experience of working in English workplaces has been, you know, oh, Monday again, Monday's a rubbish out there, oh, I hate working anywhere but here and all of that kind of rhetoric, which kind of rolls off the tongue in the workplace. Uh, when I worked, when I was, I was in Australia, I did the working visa, um, it was in Sydney, it was working there. And you just didn't have those conversations. You know, people were just, they went into work, they did their job and they didn't really like, they would only talk business, but they wouldn't talk about what the business was or, you know, what they thought of it. They were just like, it's a job. It pays me. I do my job. Then I go out and I live my life and whatever they were into, they would have, you know, if they were scuba diving, they'd have all the kit or whatever it was. And then it was just a very different um, vibe for me. I was very surprised by that. And equally doing this, uh, because again, I was like, everyone's just going to moan about work because that's what the English are like. Pretty much everyone I've spoken to is like, yeah, no, I really like my job. I, I like doing it. It gives me a lot of satisfaction. I get a lot out of it. So I was quite surprised to hear that when a lot of the time you hear about how miserable people are in their jobs and how unsatisfied. And I know that exists and I know those people are out there and I do want to speak to them at some point. Um, but that's not the experience that I've had in terms of who I'm actually speaking to. So it's, it's, it's very interesting to me. And as well, the amount of people who are doing things along the lines that you're doing, where they're we're trying to create new things and trying all the stuff that politics isn't doing, politics fails to do, that economics fails to do. There are people all over trying to do these things, trying to build a new system, trying to build a new way of living, trying to adapt to climate change trying to actually move society forward rather than it just staying in this weird stasis forever of just like you know you get a new toy but other than that it doesn't seem like history or anything any kind of developments really happening it just seems to be kind of stuck in a lot of ways that that's my impression anyway no i think it's fascinating and i think the word work as well is like when you're doing the thing you love doing, it doesn't feel like work, does it? Again, go back to that flow. Yeah. You know, if if all of your serotonin and your dopamine, you know, you're getting all of that hit, it's like that didn't feel like work at all. So to other people, it might look like you work hard. Mm. Actually, the work that's hard for me is the stuff like, why doesn't someone just let me put a shipping container down where I want to put it? <laughs> <laughs> The rumination of that question, I couldn't tell you how much that occupied. That feels like work. Yeah. Um, the bits that I just can't quite puzzle out, but that in, even that problem is a sort of interesting puzzle. It's not a, this is going to depress me and I hate waking up every day to this problem. It's like, a, maybe today things will be different. <laughs> <laughs> I'll meet someone who said, Do you know what? I'd really like to have a lovely thing happen on my land. Or even better still, go, here's a pot of money. With my dog in the background there. You know, you, you seem to be doing a good thing. Come on, crack on. You know, just do more of that good thing. Because looking at your track record, 
you're not harming anybody, you know, mm. and maybe, maybe you're doing a good thing even, you know, that if I was a funder or patron of the art, you know, patron or a secret investor or any of those things, which I do dream about quite a lot, actually, I just would make it so much easier for the generally all right people. I'm not saying like they're doing anything miraculous, mm. just to do a bit more of what they're doing. Like, yeah, or to help them on their way a bit more. That that would be a, a marvellous thing to do. And I know there are public funders out there, but there's so much risk attached to the way that they distribute monies. And they are working on this. You can see there's some really interesting developments in the space of funding, which is looking at things like emergence and um, there's some beautiful things on stewarding loss. You know, so the idea that things will come to an end and there's going to be grief and... How do we finish things as much as so you talk about maintenance? Mm. You know, so care and all of those processes, which are careful processes, fill, filled with care. Mm. You know, there is some green shoots in all of those areas, but it's just we've got this battle really of that emergence on the one hand of a more beautiful way of being, a planet which is in massive distress, or our, our time on it is in massive distress at least. And then you've got the dinosaurs of the petrochemical era who really don't like the idea that maybe this future isn't going to help them. Mm. And that's why we see so much war and divisiveness. Mm. Because that's not going to benefit those people who benefit from our misery. Mm. Thank you for letting me have this therapy session. <laughs> I hope we don't play as the antidote to all of this shit, but... It's very hard to convey that sometimes. Yeah, I, I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of closed doors. So, you know, what are you going to do while you're locked in the corridor? Well, you've got to pass the time somehow. And uh, coming up with games would be a good way to do it. And and can be, you know, it, it's getting the creative juices flowing. It's getting your 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 imagination flowing. It's it's creating the the groundwork, the soil for you to sort of generate creative projects and. You know, making it fertile. The other question that I was going to ask you along the lines of being silly questions, um, I'm assuming you're a fan of Taskmaster. No. no. Have you never seen I've it? I've watched it. Okay. <laughs> I know I really should. Uh, you should, yes. Because uh, I was, uh, well, I was going to ask you, it, it's basically, it's English parlor games, basically, and this obsession with parlor games that the English seem to have. <laughs> um, so I was going to ask you questions along those lines of like, do you see any of this play of being in the tradition of kind of of parlor games of, of you know, just getting people to do silly things and seeing how they tackle it? Not enough, actually. And I think that there were gaps. There were really big gaps in our preferences. So like my preference hasn't had like a tradition of parlor games, but yeah. we do work with people like, I don't know if you've come across Anne from Cards or Die. No, not yet. Oh, she's amazing. She she'd be great for your podcast. So she's she's both a sort of amazing. Um, she does things called Story Club with us. So she's really good, hmm. with all ages. But she she does board game evenings and game design. Um, and I, so where I know I've got gaps, I'll go look. I need to work with people who uh, they love this stuff. That is the way that they see play. You know, so. Um, but having said that, we've got this new format called Radio Fun Time, which is what I used to call my cassette recording radio show when I was nine, I think. <laughs> it's about nine. Radio Fun Time, it's called. So we've brought that back up for a digital age. And so we do the Zoom recording on Sundays between 11 and 12. And it's like a it's Zoom's output to, radio, well, output to YouTube and then potentially one day a podcast. Mm. But it's a kind of little motley collective of people who... Uh, so we've got Claire who's out and about and so she's kind of live in a particular location and she's up to any challenge except for being naked or running like, so she's <laughs> so it's not quite parlor games but it definitely is the kind of I feel like the puppet master I'm sat at home and I'll say Claire will you and so or would you and then so do other people come up with challenges for Claire and she's game for anything really so um <laughs> She's gone up to dog walkers and asked if they'll roll down a hill with her, for example. <laughs> and yesterday's show, um, another person on the show is a poet. And she's like, oh, I think you just walked past my friend's house. 
the one with the red door and I was like ah, go and knock on the door and run away or hide <laughs> so we had this um what do we call it I used to call it cherry knocking back in Gloucestershire and nobody else in our zoom room called it that they called it knock knock run and knock on knock knock ginger or something knock and run knock knock ginger did you used to do that I don't think we had a name for it I'm sure I've you know I'm sure as a kid I've run people's doorbells and run away it's a, it's a standard isn't it really <laughs> it doesn't seem to happen as much anymore or and so this was the fun so the things that Claire sort of seems to be up for which I absolutely love is is anything really yeah. and she did run yesterday so that was like she broke one of her own rules really but um is this thing of going uh, so she went roller skating even though she doesn't feel very confident roller skating and then then there was this chat which seems to be an emerging theme which is the middle aisle oldie or little so out of this came a would you roller skate down the middle aisle of Aldi mm. um and so then she's like well I might do and then I might buy a kayak because they always sell, sell weird things like kayaks and other <laughs> things in the middle aisle so it, it went from this idea of actually going roller skating down the middle aisle of Aldi to actually just going kayaking which was another thing that she's not done so the first step of that was then to go over to Beeston I think it was to pick up a kayak which was pumped she went there and pumped it up and then sat in a kayak in the middle of a back street in Beeston. Uh, <laughs> and then a future episode, someone who actually makes wooden canoes and kayaks has said that she'll take her out on the canal with a real one. Mm. So you can kind of get the way that this is emerging, can't you? Sort of like we have these daft ideas in the middle of this Zoom thing, mm. which leads to something else, which leads to something else, which leads to something else. Mm. But the middle aisle of Aldi, I think, might become a sort of motif almost because then yesterday she rummaged around it's completely different you know and found a sock dryer and we were like what what on earth is a sock dryer and so anyway and then the other part what of the really show like? what, what right, it, it was like a circular thing with like it almost had two pieces of wire or metal with like three sort of bits in it I think you're supposed to clamp your socks, but we weren't really sure, to be honest. <laughs> we were a bit mystified by this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the mid aisle of Aldi or Lidl is quite a playful thing, I think, in itself, because there's such mm. random stuff in there. You never know what you're going to find, do you? Yeah. Um, and one day, wouldn't it be amazing if they gave us a little bit of sponsorship even to to do more mid aisle stuff? So yeah. I don't know if this has answered your question, but the... <laughs> maybe that thing of challenging ourselves and others to do things they haven't intended to so let's uh, we'll just do a quick bit on the future so you've obviously got you know you've got some idea of how the future is being envisioned for us you seem to have some idea of how you want the future to be envisioned for yourself um how do you how do you see things going forward? I mean, like from a work perspective in terms of the business, what would you like to happen? What do you think is possible? All of that kind of stuff, really. Like, do you, do you think that this could be built out into like a large chain around the country or around the world of people and it was like a paid for thing and you're creating spaces for people to play in? Or do you think this is, you know, you're starting a revolution or what, what's the way, what's the way you want to think about this? Yeah, um, so the money side of things is, uh, an interesting question so like money allows you to have freedom and flexibility yeah so you know the aside from sort of bringing in a decent income and I mean decent enough to not worry about things in a way not not extravagant amounts of money I think the um the dream is to create more surplus so that we can reinvest into other people's ideas mm -hmm. so the more we can be a bit more, well, yeah, the more commercially focused we can be in some of the elements we do, the better I think we'll be at Robin Hood stuff. Uh, I'll give you an example. We're turning one of the shipping containers into something that could produce donuts mm. and other baked goods. Mm. Partly because we start with what, what we know people like. Okay, so we're not trying to convince people to try a new thing yet. We're going, you like donuts. Uh, people will buy donuts. <laughs> donuts are good. Have a donut. <laughs> they're fun, you know. Uh, but that isn't the 
only thing we want to do, we don't want to create like a donor emporium for shipping containers, but we, we know that that is one crucial part of our jigsaw puzzle is to go, we need to actually, um, not that we need to, we want to create fun ways in which people can enjoy baked goods. Yep. As well as learn to make them and also have a pop-up space in which to try out their own, um, so, so curate that space as well for other people to be able to book it and do their own thing. So enterprise as well. So so some of those parts of our jigsaw puzzle are going a little bit of longevity in a, in a space where we can grow and build our own concept, yeah. but it creates space for other people's ideas to come to fruition. So whether it's a, I just want to try something this weekend, or actually I want to incubate an idea longer term, uh, I want to test the market for something. So done playfully and creatively, obviously resourcefully, collaborative stuff um as a model really so if we can the sort of terminology we're using is if we can take waistbands and turn them into playgrounds so places which most people would sort of look and think that's a bit of scrubland or doesn't currently live up to its physical potential mm-hmm. it could be shopping centers i mean we are obviously talking about shipping containers a lot but equ- equally there's a lot of what's called void space yeah you know empty shops plots of land yeah you can if you start putting those glasses on you will see it everywhere it's it's yeah. just there's always reasons why it is as well and actually by even saying can we do something in that space what you do even just by asking that question is make someone else value that space differently yeah so it's kind of like oh you want to do something in this well it's going to disrupt this 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 and this and this by mm. doing that you know so you get into really interesting conversation conversations about space quite quite often Mm-hmm. managed decline as I like to call it not always very well managed <laughs> um, so so that model I think is one that we'd like to be able to operationalize a bit better and run it consistently and well giving me the freedom to then try something new whilst that's running well mm-hmm. and to create space for other people to try something new so I, I really do like setting new things up and catalyzing stuff whereas mm-hmm. there are luckily for me other people who do like to do more consistent, regular, structured day-to-day stuff. Mm. So the dream for me would be I've created a vehicle which allows me to constantly be gently disrupting the status quo, bringing in enough money to be able to support other people to do more of what they love Mm. and not feeling precious really about the blueprint of it all. So I don't really want to, I don't, I don't know if the business model would allow this, but I don't want to be like the McDonald's of play. I just want to go, there's a networked approach to this. And the more that we share and open source our knowledge in different places, yeah. let's not be afraid that we have to have ownership of all of this because actually you're constantly creating new things. Mm-hmm. But actually it's scary to keep constantly creating new things when you've got to write yourself out the picture for yeah. it to succeed. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, there. No. Yeah, it does. So when you're doing stuff now, do you take donations and or do you charge people? How are you how are you operating it? Do you normally get funding for it and then go from there or yeah, so we've we've mostly operated a sort of uh, either a funded or some tickets or sales. Like yeah. if we can get the balance right between it being so what we don't want to do is just work with one type of demographic. Yeah. So sometimes people have more than enough cash in their hand to be able to pay for things and others won't so we need to create that environment where you're not thinking oh no I'm the person getting the freebie here so so that does require sort of a funded model or an explicit model which other people pay more knowing that it supports other people to Mm -hmm. have a go so that that's an interesting challenging one um the bakery and thinking more commercially so we're working with partners to sort of look at how we are more commercial in our thinking because it hasn't been the number one motivation, to be quite honest. So I think it, I'm at the age now where I'm like, I think I've done enough of the sort of experimentation on how not to run a business. <laughs> so now it's the success part. <laughs> now, now, now it's the bit of going, I want to do, do more of this, but and I don't even mind the idea, I'm going to say this quite quietly, I don't even mind the idea of dropping dead on the job quite quietly, because I love what I do. <laughs> children aren't that happy about that notion though but but, (laughs) that isn't the issue for me it's like I just don't want to have this bumpy kind of cash flow of what can we get 
what can we do this this week depending yeah. on what's in the bank you know so your hazmat suit question or the you know of course we might still decide that wasn't the best use of funds but it's better to be able to go we have the choice rather than we just couldn't do it yeah because you know we have the money to make some good decisions and it did turn out that hazmat suits were the right way to go forward with this project um, or you know zorb ball whatever's um yeah. but we don't really have enough flex really in our current way of working to be able to sort of do more inventive imaginative bonkers stuff <laughs> if that makes sense if i get the feeling that you'd love to have a chance at doing some some bonkers stuff i think people like it so i think again go back to what do people like mm. as much as they like seeing cardboard and chalk and bubbles and things i think there is that bit of like oh, i wouldn't expect in that today mm. so it's getting the blend isn't it between it's almost like the circus has come to town but then soon you're going to be the circus yeah yeah nice do you have stores for all your stuff that how you you know obviously the um shipping container would be a good place to store a lot of stuff but where do you store the shipping container <laughs> well, this is it <laughs> so that that is the constant bit of like if if i was a um so the, the imaginative part of me thinks i want to be a female property developer but not one that is just doing it for extractive capitalistic not mm. that there's anything wrong with people who do do that by the way but that model does seem to be a little bit like this isn't putting money back into the system yeah. in the same way so I think I need to learn the skills so that I'm not just looking to rent space. Mm. That whole load of us who wouldn't normally consider ourselves to be able to do this um, can, yeah, that we can we can acquire this sort of know-how and the, the knowledge of how to do this for ourselves. Mm. Because otherwise you just you're always precarious if you're renting. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that seems massive and beyond me, quite honestly. But how can I go from not having any space at all to actually creating more commons for others? That's really what it is. That's really what it is. So I've changed it up a bit. Did you notice? Did you care? Let me know. Please remember to like, share and subscribe to this show. Please become a patron. It's only quid a month and it'll be such a morale booster for me, honestly. I might do a jig. Give me a sign. Give me a pound. I do want to get to a thousand of these, and the only way I can do that is with you listening, liking, sharing, and offering financial contributions so that we can raise awareness and reach that thousand people. And of course, for any lawyer listening to this, the biggest way that you can help the podcast is by coming on this show. It's not scary, and it's not stressful, and your voice will sound so much better with intro and outro music bracketing it. I'm really interested to hear from anyone in Leeds, or from Leeds, in whatever industry, sector, or role you're in. What is your experience? How do you feel about work? What do you like and not like? What do you do, Leeds? Email this podcast now, workinghourspod at western-studios.com with a short bio and some suggestions of your availability to hashtag be my guest lead, or just send your feedback, questions, comments and queries. You can also follow this show on Twitter at workinghours3 and on Instagram at workinghourspodleads. Next time on Working Hours, I am talking to a fundraiser from a charity. Same Leeds time, same Leeds channel. Working Hours is presented, edited and recorded by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from Music.